I want to thank Folk Music Ontario again. I was going to say for the Estelle Klein Award they kindly awarded me last year. I am absolutely so pleased that Tana Slimmin is this year's recipient. It is, you know, something that that is really important because this this award really does acknowledge um, the contribution that people make to the folk community. And I know, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into this in a few moments, uh, chatting about the importance of recognition for a lot of people. There's a lot of people who do great work within our community and we haven't had a chance to, to thank them. So hopefully over the coming years, maybe we'll be able to broaden what we're able to do to acknowledge people's contributions. But we're here to acknowledge the contribution of someone who's very special to me, Tanis Slimmon. I've known Tanis for a lot of years. I've interviewed her quite a few times. In fact, in preparation for this interview today, I was checking back through some of the interviews we've done over the years. Tanis, I was obviously so pleased that you picked up this award. Uh, we're going to talk about your life in music, your life in folk music uh, generally, and in the community. I know you live in the wonderful music community of Guelph. That is definitely your home now. But before we get into chatting about your music and your life now, I want to turn the clock back and start off in Manitoba because you grew up on a farm in Manitoba. And one of the best parts of interviews for me is learning about how people got into music, uh, a little bit of a an insight into their early life. So I'm going to turn it over to you and this is your time, not mine, and I promise not to talk quite so much the next time I ask a question. So tell us a little bit about growing mm -hmm. up in Manitoba and how you got into music. Okay, I will. I'm happy to. Um, but I first want to say how how lovely it is to have you as the uh, interviewer, Jan, because, yes, we do go back a few years, and uh, you were such an amazing um advocate for all of the music that went down ha in, in a certain period of time in Guelph and we want you back let's just put it that way <laughs> but um I'd love to go back to to the farm in Manitoba um, just 10 miles of a little town 10 miles north of a little town called Oak Lake and I grew up in a really musical family my mom was a pianist and um, we were all singers all six of us uh, siblings um, and my mom and dad really, really encouraged all of that and music in us, and they just surrounded us with music. Um, my mom played the organ in the church, and she led the junior choir, and whatever choir was, you know, happening in the church. Um, so we had regular music that way. She'd always be, you know, rehearsing at home, and and my dad played sax, um, and he was in bands, uh, like uh, dance bands. So a lot of our, our time, I think, other than working on the farm, um, where there were a lot of chores, because it was a dairy farm, dairy mixed grain. Um, so there was like the crops during the, during the summer, but every day of the year, there were chores. There, were, there was the milking to be done. So we didn't go uh, a lot of places as a family, um, because we always had to be home at six o'clock for the, for, the, uh, for the chores. But uh, we did get to go to a lot of dances and a lot of concerts. And um, I do remember my mom, um, I guess she encouraged me um, by, by saying yes a lot of times on my behalf. Yes, she will sing in this concert. Yes, she will sing for that event. Yes, of course. And then she would accompany me if that was appropriate. And um, so I spent a lot of time around the piano with my mom and and the rest of our family we used to join around uh, join in around the family uh, piano for wonderful sing songs and and uh, I remember all of us yeah all of us joining in and my dad and my brother who played clarinet they would both be on the horns and uh, my brother played um, played in a band when he was so cool he played in a band he was just older than me and he had this fabulous record collection I used to sneak up to the attic to listen to his really, really wide variety of, of, uh, of music and uh, all, his, all his albums. So yes, I was surrounded by music uh, growing up and I sang in a lot of different concerts and choirs in, uh, in Manitoba. 
Yeah, it's funny you say that because I have this image in my mind of you all being around the radiogram, you know, the old radio or something mm -hmm. like that. Because, you know, I remember one of your songs, well, I think it was a Bird Sisters song that ended up on Lucky Blue, which was the Spirit House song. And oh. Susan, my partner, wanted me to bring this up because um, she always loves that song because whenever you introduced Spirit House, you would always say, well, it was a house that we bought in the from the Eaton's catalogue. Yes. Uh, but I have this wonderful feeling of, you know, what it must have been like to, to grow up on the prairies. It, uh, it was very special. Yeah. W when did you realize that you had a gift for music? Um, I guess very early on because I was asked to, or my mother asked me to, to perform in different concerts around and about. Um, we, on the corner of our farm was a one-room school. And uh, there were concerts and dances in that school, you know, for the community. And uh, often I'd be singing in those too from a very early age. And um, and when I went to school there, we would have Christmas concerts and so on. And sometimes I'd be singing in those as well. So I think it was very early on. And although I remember it being quite nerve wracking, um, it just seemed to be um, a normal thing. You know, it just it didn't seem to be uh, something that was so unusual to be doing. And so did you have any particular influences in those days? I mean, I was, in, I was intrigued by what people were listening to when they were growing up and, and, you know, starting out on this fledgling music career. Yes. Well, besides my family and the musical people in my in the Oak Lake District, I had a grade four teacher who, um, Myrtle Johnson, bless her heart, who um, pulled a few of us out of the class and, and lined us up at the beginning, at the, at the front of the classroom and had us singing uh, a, per, a particular song. And she went along and put her ear beside each of our, <laughs> each of our mouths, if you can imagine like how intimidating that is. But she pulled about three or four of us out and taught us the harmony parts for this uh, song, um, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And so that's when I started singing harmony in grade four. And what a, what a gift she gave me. Um, and there was also a woman named Elsie Wallace, who was very, very influential in, uh, in the music scene in Oak Lake because she taught music. And, um, but my brother, um, I remember him coming home from university because he was older and he would have left and, and and when my older siblings came home from university, it was the most exciting thing. We looked forward to it so much. And I would wake up in the morning to him sitting on my bed. I wouldn't have heard him come in, but he'd be sitting on my bed playing guitar and playing, you know, uh, Elizabeth Cotton um, or um, Blackbird or something like that. And that, that's how I would wake up. And it was just the most joyous thing. And I mean, if that doesn't influence you to, you know, to feel good about music. <laughs> and then he encouraged me when I was 17 to go, uh, he said I had to come to the Winnipeg Folk Festival. And I think it was in its, in 1975, it was probably in its third or fourth, maybe very early on anyway. And Taj Mahal was gonna be playing and he said, you have to come and hear Taj Mahal. And it turned out that Taj Mahal couldn't get over the border. So, but it got me to the festival. And, uh, and that's when, you know, Mitch Podolik's um, influence was huge because here was this prairie girl that kind of grew up with big band. My, my parents loved big band music and, you know, songs, old kind of old songs around the piano and also, um, I guess, church music. But here was the world of music brought to to the my doorstep, I guess, on the prairies, and it was just it just opened my eyes, and I thought, oh my God, this is this is where I belong, <laughs> and that became my Christmas every year, oh, and I right. continued to go when I was living in Manitoba, but when I moved to Guelph, I continued to go. So I've gone to the festival um, forty times. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. over the years yeah i just kept going back and you know timing it f with a family visit but also just uh that festival's very near and dear to my heart as it's mitch Fidolic. no that is that is fabulous what a wonderful story now i think you actually were in your first band in manitoba as well right the six teens tell us a little bit about that well it was um i think in junior high school where a bunch of us got together six gals and um 
three of them were extremely gifted musicians and could all play the piano. And so we always had an accompanist amongst us and they could sing harmonies like nobody's business. So we were the band that sang at the Remembrance Day services and, and we got, to, you know, we were asked to sing at weddings and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, we were kind of, you know, a really cool six teenagers. Um, and, uh, the funny thing is that we started kind of going, as we grew older, we kind of got into pop music and I feel like that's like when we started, started to become less popular in town. <laughs> I think they were more used to us playing the sort of more traditional material, but. So after school, you ended up at the University of Manitoba, right? Doing agriculture. But yes. that's actually the link that gets you to Guelph because those of us yeah. who met you in Guelph, you know, always were aware of the the Manitoba story, Oak Lake, growing up there. But we right. didn't really always understand how you ended up making Guelph your home. So uh, tell us a little bit about why you decided you would go to Guelph. It was rather serendipitous, I must say, because I was the second year president in our um, in our year of agriculture, and as such, I had to give announcements in the classes. And I remember getting up and announcing this one award that people were, you know, uh, welcome to um, apply for, and it was called the um, it was Associated Faculties of Agriculture across Canada, AFAC. So as I was reading it and realizing that this award would would enable a person to take their their third year of university at another university in Canada that offered agriculture i thought oh my god <laughs> i really want to do this i'm applying for this for sure and so i went to the library and i pulled out all the calendars for all the different universities and guelph's was by far the most beautiful i mean i still have the picture that was on that calendar is just a very fantastical horse, um, gorgeous picture. But that wasn't the only thing that drew me to Guelph. I, I actually could not even pronounce the name because I'd never heard it before. But it had fantastic horticulture courses and I was kind of going in that direction but Manitoba didn't have um, as many horticulture courses and so I thought okay I'll go there for my third year and and you know, be able to take all these really amazing courses and then come back for my fourth year, which is what the plan was. But I ended up getting the award and and getting to Guelph and I could not believe, first of all, the, the architecture in Guelph, it, it just seemed so old, so much older than Guelph, than Manitoba, which it is. I mean, it settled so much here. And we didn't have the like the massive stone buildings and and uh, beautiful brick buildings as much in Manitoba, so um, it really felt like I was in Europe or something. And then the music was just it seemed to be all around us in smaller venues than it would have been in Manitoba. I think Manitoba situated like Winnipeg situated, um, you know, so far from um, the the population base like it would be here so I think there were a lot more musicians around and the people that I was seeing at the Winnipeg Folk Festival were in smaller clubs here so it we I saw a lot of um, a lot of really great bands that I'd seen at the Winnipeg Folk Festival but just you know right up close so that really drew me and I also got involved in music right away in university um, a friend of mine who it became a friend of mine because of this he started up this thing called the Musicians Guild it was a club on campus and it started immediately and I was immediately as soon as I got there in my in my third year and I was in the front row you know <laughs> one of two women and the woman beside me ended up being a really great friend of mine Anne and we started a band together and we ended up playing like for many weekends through my third and then fourth year of university because I ended up like ins ensuring I wanted to I wanted to stay in Guelph so badly that I ended up transferring all my credits to University of Guelph and came back for my fourth year as well um, but Anne and I were that was the first band that I was in in uh, in here in Guelph and we played at the Whipple Tree at the University of Guelph once a month and I paid my rent by doing that so it really felt amazing to uh, to start actually getting you know getting paid for music. Wow, 
And, and that band was Tannis, right? That's Tannis yes. with a capital A A A N N in the middle of it. Yes, because yeah, her name is right in the middle of mine, so we just named it that. So it was music that held you there. I mean, or was it? You know, you you've had this remarkable life because you know you really have been able to achieve two parallel careers and i do want to spend a little time talking about uh the research career that you ended up in guelph because i think it's important that an awful lot of people in the community that we know through folk music ontario often have the two sides to their life and manage them very successfully you i think would be somebody i think who managed it tremendously successfully over the years um, because you what retired I think from Guelph just a couple of years ago so yes, tell us a little bit about how all that happened okay well I call it redeployment because I've always been a musician and it was kind of like a parallel career um, and um, but at the beginning I went to university because I didn't I actually wasn't like um, it wasn't a really a career choice I thought because I didn't think that I could make you know, make a living. And, uh, and true enough, I don't think I could have made a living. <laughs> so um, I was kind of practical and, and I was, I grew up on a farm and it just seemed really natural that um, I was very in interested in agriculture and I had summer jobs in agriculture. So um, I got my, my bachelor degree and then I started working in the department um, as a technician because I was determined to move back to Guelph and I got this job and I was just so pleased. And then I went on to do a master's as well. Um, but by that time, I was involved in a couple of bands. Um, so it was it was a challenge. I must admit, working a five day week and then say going off to a festival on the weekend and having this huge, amazing experience. And then, you know, Sunday night coming home after the, the grand finale at a festival, let's say, and just having this huge love in with all the people, all the musicians that, that played there and, and meeting so many new friends and, and then coming back and going to work on Monday morning, exhausted, I must add, and just feeling like I just was the sort of the Superman Clark Kent, not exactly, but you know, you'd put on your lab coat and, you know, basically change your hat and get back to work. And then by the time the next weekend ran ran around and you were off to another festival, it was you just about, you know, uh, got your strength back and and caught up on your sleep sleep so that you could go at it again. So I must admit, I think I got sick a lot during that period because I didn't sleep enough, and I remember being sick quite often. And when the Bird Sisters started, um, we were very busy and we did a lot of touring. We went into the States a lot, which was just amazing. Um, I kind of love music, you know, the, the touring part of music, because probably because I didn't do a lot of it because I had a full time job. Um, but when we did go out, it was that much more special. But I do um, remember. Um, Oh, I lost my train of thought. So you're welcome to jump in. Well, I actually want to, we, we're going to dig into the music in a, a few moments because there's lots to talk about. But I, I want to talk about a very special person that you met through music. I mean, huge part of your life, I would say. And of course, that is Lewis Melville, the wonderful Lewis Melville. Um, I always tend to think Tennis Slim and Lewis Melvin that just go together, which is the way <laughs> it should be with a wonderful relationship like yours. Mm. I think you met in 82 and you did meet through music, didn't you? Yes, he joined the band that I was in. Um, the guitar player was going to be going off to do something else. So um, the fellow who also had started the Musicians Guild, who asked me to be in the band, we'd been we'd been practicing and um, performing for a few months together. His name is Pete LeBlanc, by the way, and he's a dear friend. And I thank him so much for uh, for the opportunities that he provided me and, you know, set me on a path. But um, yeah, the guitar player was quitting. So um, Lewis came to one of the gigs that we were playing and um, and then he, he joined the band right away. And just within a few months, we were already going together. <laughs> and um, yeah, one of our first dates was actually going down to Grimsby to pick up a PA system that he had rented to Tom Wilson and the Florida Razors. And this was very romantic. 
<laughs> going down and hauling gear. So my... it, it sounds like, was it just one of those situations, you know, when you, you like to, to think it happens, and it, it obviously did for you. We just knew that this is the person I'm meant to be with. Yeah, he was, he was just a real enabler, and it still is. He has helped me so much over the years. Just he's so incredibly skilled um, as a musician, as an engineer, um, as a sound person, as a producer, um, as a cook. <laughs> you know, he's just he's just helped me so much as an artist. You know, he'd help me a lot with the graphics if I needed some something um, for my album cover or that sort of thing. I could always rely on him to pull out. You know pull out his magic um, quill and uh, make something beautiful for me. So I, I must say that I would not be, I would not have done probably half or more of what I have done if I hadn't met Lewis and I, if we hadn't joined up. Um, so we were in a band together right away in 1982 and that band I think was together until um, 89 when it broke up and there was lots of overlap with other bands like the bird sisters and then I joined big smoke That was so amazing. Um, I must say that the band bands that I've been in Have been so incredible the the musicians in those bands are they just um, become like family and um, not only not only were they all amazing musicians and you know a, a team basically um, you know, chipping in, especially with the Bird Sisters, there was so much work to do to, um, you know, to do albums and, at, you know, back in the 80s, it wasn't something that everybody did as often as, you know, we didn't have the resources of the, of the internet to go and look up, you know, how do you do this, how do you do that? So um, it was, it was a little bit, you know, more, more work, I guess, or more energy output to figure out how it was, how it all happened. But, um, yeah, the, the bands that I've been in have been just, I just want to um, pat them all on the back or give them virtual hugs, um, all the bandmates that I've been in, bands that I've been in. I get the impression that, you know, that if I came up to, well, I probably wouldn't come up to you and say, hey, I'm starting a band, do you want to join? But you probably would say yes. <laughs> but you, you do seem to be, it, it seems that, you know, you're just your personality is just very adjusted to say, well, sounds like I could give that a try. Yeah, I'd definitely like to come and see you. Are you playing in town? <laughs> so many, we're so lucky here in Guelph because there's been so many venues over the years, you know, and so many great bands that have come to Guelph. Um, and a lot of the, the fellow folkies, you know, the people that I see and meet at the Folk Music Ontario and, and the early days of the OCFF, um, they've come around and, and played in, in venues. So there's been so many wonderful concerts here in Guelph that I've attended and it's um yeah Guelph is so rich uh, when it comes to music and I guess I never thought that I would become this old to be able to look back and see a sort of a progression of music through the years but I do see kind of the waves of of, of maybe bands that were the band you know the popular bands at the time and then they perhaps go on to do other things and that the individual members join up and make another band and you can you could make a huge family tree of, of the, all the musicians in Guelph and you know various bands were you know um, musician musicians if you will that 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 musicians really really uh, um, admired and and would go to see and yeah we've we've been so blessed here in Guelph and we still are I mean it's just a continuum of incredible music here in Guelph well, you know, I do love the idea of the family tree. I mean, I, I've I've always been a, you know, since my early days, I've always been a big fan of of Pete Frame's family trees. Like he used to do the rock family trees, which is so much fun. But I, I get the impression for a Guelph one, it would have all these connections all over because that's one of the neat things about that music scene is that everybody, you know, will play with everyone. And there are so many different opportunities, it's not just within the band, but there are, you know, jams around the band, uh, celebrations brought together for, for different things occurring. Uh, it is pretty remarkable, and I know everybody who um, goes through that will chat a little bit about Anisumi a little later, who, you know, it's someone else who moved to Guelph, you know, for the, you know, the music. Um, you know, it's, it's just wonderful. 
I'd like to, uh, at this point, talk a little bit about the Bird Sisters because, you know, that was, I think, your first big band uh, with Sue Smith and Jude Vidala. Yeah. Uh, just tell us a little bit about how that started. Actually, um, Hillside started in 1984 and um, it was really fun. I remember buying my house about just a few days before Hillside weekend and I remember John Timmons coming to the door to help Lewis um, move the PA system to Hillside. So Lewis did sound. And our band that I was in with Lewis played there. Sue's band, um, Grapevine, played at the first Hillside. And Jude's band, Mowing the Lawn, Mowing the Lawn, played there. So we all had, you know, we'd seen each other before, but we hadn't, um, you know, interacted like that on that scale. So we all played at the first hillside. It was just a one day thing. And uh, Molly Kervink, a lovely um, fellow uh, musician here in Guelph, who's sadly no longer with us, but she came up to each of us and said, you should sing with that. You should sing with that. <laughs> and she was the instigator. And she in inevitably, um, or eventually, she actually named us too. You sound like birds. You should call yourself the bird sisters. So. We did get together uh, shortly after that first hillside in 1984, and we loved singing together. The harmonies were just instantly, um, you know, so it just felt so good. And um, and we had just a powerhouse of, of, of organizing and, you know, strength and songwriting and 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 the music was fantastic. And we had so much fun. We just laughed and... And I just remember touring and, and driving along in the car and just laughing our heads off. And um, and we saw a lot of country. We got down to um, South by Southwest in the early years. We played that um, two or three times. Um, we were on a compilation CD that South by Southwest put out. So they invited us down to be like guests. And, um, and we did a, a lot of touring in, down in that area and also in New England, which was a little more accessible because we could drive. Um, and we put out three albums and um, we ended up, I guess, about 11 years um, with the Bird Sisters. But uh, that was very a very formative time because um, that's sort of when I started to go to the OCFF. I'm wondering if it maybe was after that that I started to attend. Um, it may not have been, I'm not sure when the OCFF started, but we finished up in 95. So it would have been around then. But by that time, we through the bird sisters i kind of was starting to know people in the uh, folk music world a lot of the artistic directors and so on and you know all a lot of them became really good friends through that experience with the bird sisters because they would invite us we did a lot of festivals around southern ontario and farther afield as well but um it was a great way to to get to know people and we we uh, also got to know a lot of musicians of course because every time you play a folk festival you you become you know best friends with almost everyone on the bill because you're you put into workshop situations and you have to possibly come up with some collaborative ideas and and every time that happens of course you're like your lifelong friends right from that moment so yeah the bird sisters was was huge for me and um sort of defined the, you know, the path, I guess, that I took after, after we broke up, um, because I was, um, you know, I was able to sort of help with the promotional end of things with some of the, the other bands that I was in, because, um, because I knew some of the, the people in the field, I guess. So when the, when did the solo career started? I mean, you know, currently you've got the, the three albums, Oak Lake, uh, yeah. Lucky Blue, and then In and Out of Harmony. So did, was that after the Birds Sisters split that you decided that, you know, maybe it was time to, to develop not, more of a solo career? Yes, not right away. I was in a, a group called, uh, well, Big Smoke that I'd mentioned. It was a great, great band with two Steves. Um, and I was also in a great band called Crow's Feet with my dear friend Vicky Fraser. Um, and we had a lot of fun. And also another band called Benji I was in Benji for quite a while. We put out a couple of albums, but it just seemed like um, it might, you know, it might be time because people have, you know, other paths. Basically, um, people 
go off and do other things and and I think it I felt like it was maybe I I had grown musically enough that I could start to do my own thing and I wouldn't have to worry about a band breaking up because I was going to be you know the band and I wouldn't break up <laughs> so it was 2001 I put out my first album and Lewis helped me of course with not only the songwriting but the the producing and uh and then um, after that, I guess there was some probably, there was a lot of overlap of bands. So I was in different bands here and there throughout. Um, there was always a lot of juggling of, okay, if I'm rehearsing with this band, then I can't do that. And so, ooh, how is that going to work? But it was all worth it. I mean, it's, I just feel so blessed to have been able to fill my life with music that way, in addition to my employment. When the Bird Sisters broke up, we had actually considered going full-time into music, but I just could not give up my full-time job at the university. So they allowed me to go down to four days a week. And since, you know, since the sort of late 90s, um, I um, was able to, to work four days a week. So I had that extra precious day to um, you know to get to a festival say on a Friday afternoon and and that sort of thing so or it gave me a Monday morning to sleep in after the festival um, so that was a really big bonus and I thank the university for that I was with the university um, for 36 years mm. in all including a master's in there at the yeah, beginning no, yeah, so that was, that was great crazy. Crazy. What, what did they think about your music career I mean you know that my impression was that they 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 always, I mean, they always told me they like the, they like people to to stretch. You know, they they encourage their staff to to get involved in in other things, not just their job, because it's healthy as a human being. But you, did you feel like you got lots of support there? I do. I I really do feel like I got lots of support um, from my individual bosses. They were all really really understanding. Um, I mean, the last job that I had, I was working in a growth facility for 10 years and um, it was a, a job that I had to be on call for 24 hours a day so that was a little bit tricky um, but my co-worker the fellow that I um, worked with uh, kind of assisted he was a musician as well and the finest person you could imagine working with so we always were able to work it out because sometimes we were actually both in um, having a gig in the same night and uh, and so you know you know we would just work it out like I'm gonna be I'm gonna have to turn my phone off from X to, you know X number you know if what if something happens because we were on call basically to to equipment that might break down and then we would get an alarm and then we'd have to go in no matter what time of the day or night so that was pretty challenging as a musician because you'd get home from a gig and sometimes you'd have to go up you know at four o'clock in the morning to uh, to fix a chamber or something that burst you know some pipe that burst it was it was a it was an interesting time for sure I remember once we had a, a benefit concert for Sue Richards. It was Harry Helps Sue. So Harry Manx came and we played in this beautiful theater. And I remember um, there was an on, I think we were all going on for the last song. And I remember my phone going off and it was an alarm. And I had to like wait for the crowd, like the crowd was clapping and I had to figure out, you know, how to manage this and pass it over to my coworker uh, before I got on stage. It was just one of those moments that you never forget, you know, the colliding of two worlds. <laughs> so, you know, you've been in, in so many bands, you're, you're still involved, you're in, you know, Boreal with Angela and Catherine. Um, the On Dane Chorus, I think, I, you beautiful harmony work you've been mm. able to do with them. Essentia, pretty much the same thing. Yes. Uh, the Lucky Sisters uh, with Allison and, and Rosemary. Um, yeah. Yeah, only, unfortunately, the one album uh, because Rosemary was ill at the time, but what a beautiful album that is. Mm. In fact, it gives me goosebumps just to think about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. You know, you've had some amazing experiences. The amazing thing is I think that you've been on more than 100 albums now. Uh, which well, if you're in that is, many bands. Like yeah, I'm in that many bands. But uh, one of the things you love is to, to sing harmony. Does that go back to being a child and discovering that wonderful feeling 
when you think, oh my God, doesn't that, you know, how much better singing in harmony is than anything else? Yeah, I I don't know if there's anything better, <laughs> actually. When I first started out as a solo musician, I always said that I would rather be a harmony singer than a, than a you know than fronting the band, and I I think that I still feel that to a certain extent. Um, I think my my dream job <laughs> would be singing harmony with Bonnie Raitt. Mm -hmm. If I could, you know, that would be like, that's at the top of the bucket list. And uh, not so accessible on a, a goal, but <clears throat> I'm, I just I just put it out there. But um, yes, I've sung with some amazing people over the years, and I love, love singing harmony. That is my passion. And I'm now doing a lot of recording. I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from my happy place here. Um, this is my she shed. And uh, it's, I've got a little recording unit right here beside me. And um, I do a lot of, I'm, I'm now doing a lot of just uh, vocalisms and um, creating what I call vocal loves. And that's, uh, they, they don't necessarily have any, um, any lyrics. They're just, um, you know, layers and layers of my voice. It's not like Enya, but it would be, you know, um, because of, I think people understand that when you say Enya, that it's kind of a soundscape. It would be more like that than it would be like singer songwriter. Um, so I like to do both, but I really love to sing with myself and other no, people. That, that's wonderful. The she shed is beautiful. You know, when you see the pictures now, because you do backyard concerts, right? We're in this strange COVID times. I know, you know, it's uh, the only way you can really do live music safely is outdoors, um, you know, unless it's only a very small number of people or, you know, based on the current situation. But you have beautiful space because I love the story when Lewis realized that, you know, we can put a stage around here and you have a, a perfect place to play. Yeah, it was his idea. I mean, I wanted a shed for him, for his art, uh, so that he could paint with natural light. But as soon as he finished it, he said, oh, I think I'll use this other space so you can have it. And I was just overwhelmed. But we had talked about, you know, we have double doors reaching out onto a deck and th thinking, this is perfect. You know, if you just put the put the PA system right here. And, and indeed, um, my my dear friend Zeifs encouraged us to um, to, to go for it last, last summer, uh, actually in the spring, because we had a concert coming up for Hillside Festival. And um, and so she said, don't you want to do a concert before that concert just to get, you know, to get your chops up? And why don't you do one, you know, in your backyard like you've always wanted to? So that was the start of a wonderful thing. We we actually nabbed the the UR of the domain backyardconcerts.ca. So <laughs> you can actually go there and see all the concerts that we live streamed and uh, and all the lovely characters from around Guelph, all the beautiful musicians that came to play this summer. Oh yeah, I, I checked out the site. I certainly would encourage everybody cool. here to, you know, check this out. And if you're going to yeah. be, you know, I, you know, we will hopefully not be in COVID times forever. <laughs> It'll be over in yes. a, a year or so. We'll get back to normal. And it, it's a beautiful space you have. I did want to give you a chance just to talk about traveling for music. I know we're we're running short of time and if anyone has any questions that they would like me to ask Tanis, if uh, you can use the chat box and send it in and we can have a uh, we can ask any of those as we get towards the end. But I know you've been to Africa, you've been to Cuba. Um, that was in part of the uh, development of Lucky Blue, which did win the um, a Canadian Folk Music Award as well. It's still a you know one of my favorite albums ever i still i think about the the wonderful release shows you did which um i remember being at and using in those days i was just using my little recorder and i actually taped both of them and and it was funny it's like okay you know that's probably not the way you would try and tape a show but it actually turned out amazingly well such that today i was listening to to those recordings of oh my god of that's those concerts amazing. but i'd love to um, hear them Tell, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, traveling for music. I mean, you know, getting to Africa. And I think there is a uh, there is a film, right, for that that you were involved in. Yes, a filmmaker named Bay Wayman came along with us to Africa. Um, my brother-in-law lived in Mali, West Africa, 
and he um, sent a beautiful Malian musician our way when um, Mansa Sissoka was coming to Canada. And um, so he spent a week with us and Lewis, of course, recorded an album by him and got him into the CBC um, French station for interviews and introduced him to a lot of musicians in that week. And um, and at, at one point he said, you should come to Mali and, and meet my band because he actually played with a whole band. And Lewis took this to heart and started working with Lewis's brother, who was in Mali, Mali at the time. And and a year later, um, we were on the plane on our way there to um, to just soak up. Well, actually, Lewis was took his recording equipment so that he could record uh, people that were there. And we went to a school that was like the Banff School of Fine Arts at the time. It was called that. And um, and he recorded a lot of the musicians that were there, including Ali Farka Touré's son, Vieux. So we met a lot of amazing musicians, and some of them came over um, and stayed with us. We got visas for them and had them stay with us for a few months, um, a couple of different summers. And Lewis put a band around them and took them around to different folk festivals around Canada and, and uh, southern Ontario. And that was such an amazing... Um, like the, the whole African experience was just absolutely incredible. Um, the Road to Balia is the name of the movie and I'm happy, I'd be thrilled to give anyone who wants a copy of that movie. It's an hour long um, movie and uh, just just so that they can experience what we ex some of what we experienced going out to a village where Mansa um, was, was from and he, he's a griot so he was very um, his grandfather and his father were very much involved in the in the music scene in their village where there was you know just no electricity or no running water and so it was really amazing just yeah a very very formative experience for me and because of that we ended up going to Cuba because when we got back we did a concert and um, and did some music that we had you know and, and played a little bit of the of the uh, footage that we had take, taken in, in Mali and um, a, f a friend of ours came up and said would you go to Cuba with me um, because I was down there and I you know played with a band down there and I'd love you to come and record that band um, this was Daniel Fishlin so a few months later off we went to to Cuba to record um, this wonderful music down in Cuba and that's a whole story mm. in itself that I could go into but um, also the connection with, with Daniel Fishland through Silence, this beautiful venue in here in Guelph, and Gary Diggins, another fellow that owns Silence, dear friends of ours. Um, we went to Korea for a festival because of one of the fellows that they um, were friends with, Dong Won Kim, and he invited us over to do a festival leading up to the Olympics in Sochi, in, um, I think it's Sochi, in, um, in Korea just a couple of years ago so music has taken me so many amazing places I can't imagine like the doors that have been opened for me um, because I love to travel and I love to see new places and and experience the world I'm I'm sad that we can't do that right now um, I wonder whether it's probably showing us a bit of a lesson that maybe we it's a better thing to stay home and kind of be the hundred mile musician, you know, which is a little bit more environmentally friendly for sure. And um, and I do I so appreciate the the musicians that actually do stay home and kind of serve the people in their area and do all the concerts around and about. I've tried to do a little of both in my day um, because I love traveling so much. But I do, um, yeah. It's it's a it's a it's interesting that you, you know, when you do a lot of traveling and music and you're playing out a lot and you're going, you know, you're traveling a lot, you, it's harder to maybe, um, to cultivate a, a, um, a community or stay connected to your community here at home. So I regret a lot of, um, maybe not commit connecting with, um, um, people as much and, and maybe not staying up you know in communication with my family and my friends so hereby I apologize <laughs> to them for all the uh, lack of communication over the years but I've been off just having a blast and they probably know that as well. Well I imagine all of the travel 
you know, has really informed your music. We did actually just get a question from someone uh, asking about inspiring the writing of a song. Um, you know, just can you give us just a, an idea about how that happens for you? Um, the writing of a song. Well, often I will come up with a melody. That's my, that's my, I guess, forte, a melody and a chord structure and maybe an idea of a theme. But the collaboration that I have with Lewis is so good when it comes to songwriting because he's a very, he's a wordsmith. And so a lot of the words get woven in uh, by Lewis. And of course he's an arranger and so things just, you know, just become better all all around when we're when we're working together, um, and also I you know I because I'm doing the singing I'm editing things as we're going along too so we're it's a nice combination um, and of course it has to have something that people can sing along in you know some some part because I love when people join in and and can and uh, you know add their voices to it and often so often I try to. Um, have a melody that people can latch on to or, or some hook line that people can sing along to because I love that. And um, and then I get to sing harmonies to it as well or get friends to come in and sing harmonies on the album. So, so when you're putting an album together, I mean, it, I was going to ask you, you know, what your favorite songs that you've recorded are. But one of the things I notice is that there are always one or two songs that that will, you know, that, that very much encourage the audience participation. You know, Our Time Now, There's a Lift, Dum Dee Dum, and all of those, you know, I, I, we, you know, do what you do, and it's really nice. I, those are the ones that I often carry in my head, although, you know, I love things like, you know, Weather Vane, Edmonton, um, you know, just um, fabulous songs. But I, what, what songs have you written? I think, oh, yeah, these are the songs that I really that are really special to me. Do you oh, have any like that? That's a good question. I must say that I think you're reminding me that I love the group singing because, um, you know, I grew I grew up singing in in groups and um, and in choirs as well, like the University of Manitoba Choir, the University of Guelph Choir. Um, so I love that combination of voices um, and. But as far as songs that I really, um, I guess, am, I'm proud of, I think it is more the, the songs that people can join in on um, because I love the feeling and, the, and not only the, the sound, but also the feeling of having people join in. I think um, it just lifts the song for me. So I think the songs that you mentioned are probably some of my absolute favorites. Well, they start to feel hill, feel like hillside moments to me, you know, like yes. there's a lift or something <laughs> like that. Um, we're running short of time, so I do want to to steer the conversation until talking a little bit about community. Um, Estelle Klein, you know, the award is named after her. A uh, huge impact on the folk community in Canada, not just Ontario especially at Mariposa. I think you had a chance to meet her, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did indeed. Um, she hired the Bird Sisters for um, at least one Mariposa when we were on the island. It was on Toronto Island. And um, I'm sure I saw her as well at some of the early OCFFs um, because I remember her um, as a very, as a sage, I would call her a sage. I looked up to her so much. She was so wise, very serious, um, but so influential to so many people. I maybe didn't know that at the time, um, although you, you you are aware of the people, not not movers and shakers, but you're aware of the people who make things happen, like ma that are in the organizational end of things, like you know, I'm making on the board of of uh, say the OCFF or the FMO or you know um, other organizations that um, are advocating for folk music um, but she was uh, yeah she definitely stood out as being one of the influential people in my life because she mentored other folk festival artistic directors and subsequently you know we all win um, I think she had a particular love of 
putting different musicians together in workshop situations and that's my favorite thing in a, of a festival to go mm. and see different musicians collaborating potentially you know that it doesn't always happen but i i when i i'm on stage in that situation that's what i love the best and that's where i've made lifelong lifelong friends you know collaborating them with them just spontaneously um at a workshop so i so appreciate her um, influence in that way as well as you know so many other ways yeah talking about mentorship um, one of the things that FMO does so well is the developing artists program it used to be the youth program I have uh, been involved in my own little way uh, since I started going because now I get to interview the mentees and also the mentors and one of the things I love I mean I just I love I, I get so excited when you're talking to, to young performers about their music and and hearing what inspires them and what inspires them about their mentors. Now, you were involved in the program recently. That was when you met Annie Sumi, who was originally from North Bay. I think that's right. Originally from Whitby, but she was in North Bay. North Bay, the, that's uh, right, before she University. came down. That's right yes. now. Um, but you ended up mentoring her. Oh. Um, tell us a little bit about that because your relationship has, has developed. You've been on tour together. Uh, you formed a duo, Sweet Corn and Sunflower, which I don't think have actually put anything out uh, as a full recording yet. There are some wonderful videos from Winnipeg when you were on tour. Yes. Um, but tell us a little bit about you know being a mentor. Well, that was a weekend that changed my life <laughs> when Teresa Levasseur, bless her heart, put us together. Um, Teresa was looking after the uh, the developing artist program at the time and uh, possibly still is, I think. Um, she, she's done it for many years and she has a magic way of finding the perfect mentor for the perfect mentee. And uh, she was very excited herself and I think it turns out she was standing back you know as we were all gathering in the room for the first time she was you know waiting to see the sparks between Annie and myself and I've got goosebumps <laughs> all over my body and just went just turned on right right then when I said her name because she's a lo just a lovely lovely person uh, she's the love of my life <laughs> and I was uh, just I'm so I feel so blessed to have been um, paired with her that fateful weekend in 2014 just after I had lost one of my best friends um, yeah our dear friend Sue Richards who you know well and uh, it was just a month later, um, just over a month later or so, that um, that Annie came into my life, and um, yeah, we have had such a blast together ever since. And yes, I kind of lured her to Guelph by showing her all the, you know, the the most wonderful things about Guelph, and she ended up meeting wonderful people like um, from the Lifers and Tragedy Anne and you know, Liv and Anita and Braden and Sam and so many other people. And, and I think she realized that this was a really great place to, to settle for a while. And, um, and it sure has been wonderful for me. Yeah. We should ask you about new music. I always ask you about this. I was just listening to myself earlier, asking that exact question. <laughs> um, you know, you, you've got the she, she shed, you're working on this layering, um, those projects, I, I I feel though there probably will be an album with you and Lewis sometime. I always feel like I'm putting pressure on you when I say that, but <laughs> doing well, anything. right now I'm actually working on putting recording some songs with Boreal. Oh, um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to try to put out a song a month for a year, and end up with an album at the end of the year. So. We would normally pl be playing a lot of shows and our season is kind of November, December. We welcome winter. And um, and because we're just reduced to one live stream show so far um, from the River Run here in Guelph, we're going to try and sort of, you know, eke our songs out over the year and then and then have the time to record too, um, each in our own little spaces and sending tracks, you know, through the through Google Drive and, and mixing remotely and um, so it's a good challenge, and and we're rising to the to the to the uh, to the challenge, and it's, it's working out really really well because because the 
you know, the characters involved are pretty sweet, my, uh, my Boreal sisters. Um, and I've been kind of trying to record a covers album for quite a, quite a few years. And for some reason, it just hasn't happened. And um, I think, I'm wondering if maybe this um, vocal love idea, which I'm even more passionate about, might come out sooner. Um, I've, you know, we've been putting off doing an album, myself and Lewis, because of this um, covers album that was intended to be out like years ago. Um, somehow that just, yeah, it's just been a, kind of a, a bit of a struggle. So I may just skip over it and go right to um, the vocal loves and also working with Lewis. Well, I, I'm not going to let you skip over it because I know you well enough to say, you know, one of the things I've noticed that, you know, in COVID times, people are starting to let their music come more freely. They're not holding them back uh, for the album thing, which I think is great. Certainly for anyone in radio, it's always great to get new music from people. And, and as much as it's nice to, to have the, the fully finished product, um, it's also nice to be surprised. And I know that when I've interviewed you with Boreal, we've talked over the years about, when, you know, I remember saying the last time, wouldn't it be great if the, we actually had some summer Boreal songs? So that's going to happen. That is yeah. exciting. It's been an absolute pleasure um, to talk to you. We've got time for some final thoughts. And then I've just had another question saying, does Tanis want to share a sample of her new vocal loves? And we know, I know we talked about that. I'm not sure whether you're able to do that. But I do want to give you a chance to, to, to do some final thoughts. If there's anyone that you wanted to mention that you haven't mentioned, now would be the time to do it. And then you can think about what you would like to, to finish oh, us up with. I'm sure that there are many people that I haven't mentioned that I would love to mention. Um, I felt like I was having to do homework to, uh, you know, I had to go and study my life so that I could figure it. And so many stories came out. Um, you know, came up for me um, as I was preparing for this, and uh, and I could I could send love out to so many people, and also to Hillside Festival, which was really very came along at a at a perfect time, and I was involved in trying to get it off the ground in the in the early years with um, a bunch of people and just begging people to show up, you know, in the in the early in the sort of the mid '80s. Um, I have to say that Hillside has been incredible uh, as far as being a deadline to work towards you know everybody is wood shedding just before hillside to get to get something ready for it um, it's been a deadline for you know putting out albums you know to have them ready to be you know to be able to put out a new something new um, by the time hillside runs around so I did want to send out a lot of love to hillside and to the FMO, which has been incredible. I mean, I consider the the conferences every year like family reunions because it's just so wonderful. Um, I think as musicians and people in the in the music business, um, like the radio show hosts and the the writers and the you know the artistic directors, anyone who presents the house concert presenters and anybody who advocates for the arts in for our kind of music, um, I think we um, we are obviously in it for the music and also for the relationships, and the relationships have been so so important to me over the years because I feel like maybe people in this industry this folk music world kind of understand each other a bit more um, uh, you know they just have a, a kind of a simpatico I suppose and I do feel like um, they are family to me so I um, I want to send a big hug out to the FMO family and, and the people that organize it like Elka and Joel and and uh, all the organizers over the past you know past many years for keeping that organization alive so that we can meet together and um, bring up all, all the best of ourselves to um, to that weekend and beyond. Yeah, well, so, hopefully we will all be together in person next year. Yeah. I did just get one other question, which is a, a very important question. And, and if you want to still think about your vocal love, I will not let you leave this interview without doing something. Okay, vocal. I think I can probably play. But I, I want to ask you this question because it's a very important one. Somebody just asked me, uh, besides music, what keeps you grounded during these days? 
um, for wellness because you know we've I'm sure we've all had our times it's it has been a a wild six months and you know we're unfortunately not out of it yet but I think there is hope for the future I think we're adapting also but what is what do you think are your keys that are, are helping you stay grounded during this time it's a great question um, I started this whole pandemic with um, an injury I injured my foot and then I fell down the stairs within a couple of days and um, I couldn't walk for a few weeks quite a few weeks um, I couldn't walk well and I kind of fell out of I mean with all the news and everything that was happening I really um, like a lot of us I think um, I've, I've went into a pretty dark place and it was actually only through sort of getting active again physically active I think um, you know having a regular exercise routine has been crucial for me and it and it has been for years um, I've got a regular um, zoom a, a gang that has adapted to zoom um, and we we exercise together like three times a week and I have this other exercise class that I can go to and yoga I think that um, to keep moving and to keep uh, physically active is actually absolutely crucial in my life and that from that a lot of other things you know flow um, when I fall out of, of, of fitness um, I'm a grumpier person that's <laughs> basically <laughs> and so that that was a really good question because I know a lot of people um, probably have you know um, obviously have suffered a lot um, I feel very blessed that we were able to you know have an outlet and do these backyard concerts um, and and still play like every weekend almost every weekend this summer uh, in some shape and form and have our our musical friends here as well to play we d only played to you know five or ten people um, in the yard but we were able to live stream it to the to the world so that was very um, yeah I, I must say that when I'm not playing for a while I also get kind of grumpy and I don't realize that that's why so um, when I start playing again and singing again I oh right okay that's what I was missing and that's what that's what actually also is very grounding for me is just singing singing on my own singing with other people oh, that's beautiful that's well, you know I know that um, I've been encouraging as many people as possible to buy the music because I know we live in this streaming world now and unfortunately you know I find a lot of artists actually are often talking about wanting to get their music streamed even before they get it put on the radio these days which um, you know for a lot of people I think um, I'm not sure that's exactly the right approach but uh, you know rather than streaming the music buying the music because that really does make the most difference to the lives of the artists because it you know as you just mentioned I mean it's really hard when people can't get to play live and share their the beautiful gift of music with them yeah it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today Tanis and as it has for me Jan you're amazing <laughs> well, do you want to hear know, a little vocal love we would love to hear a little I think I can love. do it I have to share my screen so I'm going to maybe put up a picture that my partner Lewis um, he created this I'm just gonna stop talking and let you listen this is just a little diorama that Lewis created in a cabinet of curiosities in our front yard and changed it every day with a painting so that's another thing that kept me sane throughout this pandemic time but here's a little a little bit of a vocal love and I hope you can hear it just a, an, a little a little idea you know and it could be it could be something like a soundscape behind some visuals in a in a video we'll see I'm excited you know and I have to say I do love the little cabinet of curiosities that 
Lewis did. He is a very special man. You're so lucky <laughs> to have him. You got that um, right. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I know we're seeing messages from everyone who is watching this today. Uh, they all really uh, have appreciated hearing from you today. Oh, yes. Wow. What can we say? The Estal Klein Award is a fabulous award. I hope FMO over the years will look at ways to, to broaden the people that they can acknowledge each year because I think that would be a, a wonderful thing. Uh, any final thoughts before we let everybody go, Tanis? Well, that's a wonderful way to wrap up, actually, Jan. I just want to say that this has been a life-changing experience for me to be awarded this because... Um, because it's just such an incredible acknowledgement. I'm going to start to cry. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm just going to hold that back and say, I am so, um, I've been so blessed by so many people I in the folk music world. I look around me and see people that have put their heart and soul into um, what they do, what they contribute in, in our um, music world. And I think there's so many people that are deserving of recognition and I feel uh, a little bit funny um, you know it's just hard to receive an award when you know so many other people are you know give so much and it anyway I'm, I'm very 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 grateful to the Folk Music Ontario um, organization that will hopefully keep acknowledging all those folks um, to come well, I did want to thank FMO for putting this on. It is a fabulous organization. I'm certainly looking forward to getting together next September. But to, to Joel Elliott and Alka Sharma from Folk Music Ontario, uh, Joel has looked after the sound and video. And I hope everyone out there has enjoyed this as much as I know Tanis and I have. We could go on and on. Uh, we will be getting together again to do another version of this for the radio, which I'm definitely looking forward to. Yeah. And I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I didn't actually see you, but I felt you. <laughs> yeah, I felt them too. <laughs>